Hello and welcome back to Extraordinary People, the Pride of Britain, a new podcast brought to you from the Pride of Britain team, that's us, and our friends at TSB. Now you might have heard about some of the things we do or even seen our awards in the newspapers or on the television. If not, or if this is your first time of joining us, then welcome aboard. It's great to have you with us. You are now part of the Pride of Britain family. It's safe to say that we all love celebrating the goodness in life, championing great people who do great things. This podcast is about you and them and anyone who makes a difference. So, Today, we'll be hearing from more celebrities, experts and Pride of Britain winners about the tricky times they've faced and what's got them through them. Our first guest is a very familiar face. She's a dancer and television presenter. She is Oti Mabusi. Oti has been a big supporter of the Pride of Britain and has presented an award to our winners with the Strictly team many times. She was born in South Africa just when apartheid was ending, so her life has been one of witnessing enormous societal change. And here is Oti chatting to our Mirror Showbiz reporter, Jess Bolton, about her own extraordinary route to stardom and the lessons she's learned about life along the way. Welcome, Oti. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm great, thank you, and really well. You must be absolutely exhausted. No, I'm I'm okay, you know. I'm I'm taking my minerals, I'm taking my vitamins, I'm I'm loving life, I'm being motivated by life. <laughs> but my legs though, my legs are definitely tired. You've just started your first solo UK tour, because obviously yes. you've been on tour before with the Strictly Professionals Tour and all the other ones that you do as well. But what's it like? What's it been like so far? going out there when it's all you. It's all down to you. It's your name on it. To be honest with you, when I first started, I was very, very nervous. Um, because we sold, this tour was supposed to go out two years ago, right? Mm. And I thought, mm. gosh, do people still even remember that they have their tickets? Will, will people come? Oh. And when we're here in Inverness and you see the audience, you see the, the kids, you see the moms, you see the dads. <laughs> their dads in the audience and you see them come in support because for for so long people always struggled and thought that women don't actually sell well especially tours Mm -hmm. um to be able to do it honestly as a woman i i feel so unbelievably grateful and it's and that's the thing that makes me motivated and grateful every single day that i'm a part of i guess a country where 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 we do support each other you know and Mm. do stand up for each other and we do go watch shows for each other and with each other and so i i love 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 it now i'm used to it now i can actually relax and go crazy with it uh but when i started i was just a little bit yeah i was just nervous and and i'm so glad that i've been proven that i had nothing to be nervous about now of course i just want to talk about romeo and duet because obviously we're seeing that now on TV every Saturday night whilst you're out busy touring. And yes. what was what was that like stepping into the hosting role? That was oh, do you know you know sometimes when you say you you want to do things and then they actually come to fruition. Like I've never been in this position before where mm. where I guess I, I host. I mean, I've presented, I've presented for a, for a while now, but to host yeah. my own show. Yeah. And that was, was one of those moments that you just go, my goodness, I just can't even believe that, you know, God has allowed these things to happen to me. Whatever happens, it's just been such an incredible opportunity for me to be able to do that. Um, and, and I love, I, I can't tell you how much I loved it, how much. I had so much fun filming it. How incredible, not just the production, but the crew, you know, this is like, I'm talking stage management, I'm talking cameramen, light, sound, MDs, the band. It was just so much fun to shoot that show. And, and I, and I, I would go home happy, tired, but oh, happy yeah. that I'm doing the one thing that I've, I've, I've fallen madly in love with. For anyone that's listening but might not have been able to see it yet, it's the premise is that there's a screen, much like Blind Date, 
but one person standing up on a Juliet type balcony on one side and the other person singing they can't see each other and if they like their music choice they have to come down the stairs and they will see the person on the other side and if they don't they don't come down the stairs so uh, it, I mean it's a, it's a it's a really fun concept I really like it now um, I did get full sort of Scylla Black kind of vibes when you were like peeking around the, the <laughs> thing and stuff like that. Did did you used to watch that when you were younger? Did you say- I, I didn't, you know, I didn't. And everyone just told me about it because obviously I grew up in South Africa. Yeah. So we didn't have that, you know, and I only came here when I was 24. Yeah. Um, but everyone's been telling me about it. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's incredible. You know, that people have some sort of relation to it. Um, and and I, I, w- I would have loved to grown up seeing it. And I think that would have been some a fun experience to know that, gosh, you know, you get those shows that come back after years and years. Like, I'm, I'm so lucky to be a part of something like that, that's at least similar to that. What's coming next? Because you've got all these, all these sort of irons in the fire. And obviously Masked Dancer, we've got the yes. next series of. Have you filmed that yet? Is that no? So right. during the tour, I'm filming my stanza. <gasps> so when other people get a days off, <laughs> I don't. Ot, <laughs> what are you doing to yourself? I don't know. But the thing is, listen, as a dancer, how many of these opportunities do dancers get? Yeah. yeah. How many opportunities can someone say? I've left the biggest show and I've got three, sh- like you, you can't, you know, and I'm in a position where I just can't say no to these things, but, but it's just, it, it's been incredible. And a woman in this industry as a dancer, as a South African woman, female, that it's for me, I just feel like, wow, what a country to, to live in. Um, this is the pride of Britain podcast. I'm not even British. But how lucky am I? How lucky am I to be a part of something like this? <laughs> you no, know, honestly, the pride of Britain is 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 for to celebrate everybody and everything that we, you know that needs celebrating in Britain and a bit of joy and a bit of you know sparkle to people's lives and, yeah. and from the unsung heroes to the amazing celebs that always support us and and you're always been such great support. Always. So you know that's that's why we love to have you and talk to you and 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 what we you know part of the podcast is we want to talk about the inspiring um elements people who are very inspiring to others and sort of being this role model and 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 we know about you you know you grew up in South Africa and I know you've mentioned and talked about this before but yeah I mean you were born and I don't want to give away your age because obviously every room. Really... Oh, I don't mind. <laughs> you, you you were born just as just as sort of Nelson Mandela was coming out, and and you you know that that scenario. Obviously, Moxie was born ten years before that. Yeah. And can you tell me a little bit about what it was like at that point growing up in South Africa? Because we all have heard about the mm. um, apartheid time beforehand yeah. and the horrors of that, and. It, it, it seems like something that is very difficult for us to even fathom what that could have been like. And also, what was what do you think the difference was between you and Motsi's sort of early years? I mean, I was born in 1990. That is the year that he was released. But mm. it doesn't mean that apartheid actually ended in 1990. No. No. It didn't. So um, he was voted president in 1994. But mm. again, that doesn't mean that no. it ended. So a lot of changes had to be made. Um, and growing up, it, it was it, it was my my family. I'm just saying, my dad is is very courageous. And before 1994, you couldn't really travel anywhere as as free as you wanted to. So everywhere where we used to go, we used to be pretty much the only black family going to all these areas that are mm. free now, right? Mm. But people might have not had the knowledge, they have not maybe the resources or even that desire to travel. And I guess that's why we live now overseas because our dad always said, look, I couldn't even leave this country. Like it was, if you did, it was because you're in exile. So travel, please go see the world, go go do what you want to do. You don't don't feel stuck that you have to live in this country. But growing up, we, we, very, we very much understood where we stood. Racism in South Africa was not hidden it wasn't it it wasn't subtle it was very much in your face there were signs blacks here whites here it was very much in your face but 
when I was going to school, it was all about reconciling forgiveness. Right. Yes, let's not forget because we all want to learn from your past. If you don't know where you come from, you don't know what you're fighting for, you don't know who you're inspiring, you don't know where you're from. So yes, they taught us about our history and we learned about it, but it was all, always about let's try and forgive. Let's forgive each other, live in unity and move on. Um, and obviously not everybody's going to feel the same. Not everybody's going to able to do it mm. at the same time as well. But my friends are all different races, all different cultures, all different religions in South Africa. I went to a a very open school that was academic and sports. And we all, again, were very different. Um, but it's, it's, they are certain people that, couldn't accept it but it doesn't mean it's everyone who couldn't um being dancers was difficult because mm. then we were the only black family doing a lot of traveling traveling dancing needing to be able to take lessons with some of the best dancers like coaches that were in England but obviously you couldn't um and it was my mom just fighting and sacrificing for all of us um and, it, and reminding us that we, we had a talent and, and to really work hard and let your talent speak for itself and and not lose not lose focus of who you are and where you come from. I think my dad was so hard working and and I always saw my dad working and reading and and my mom just not taking no for an answer like she was like no I don't understand no why are you telling me go tell somebody else no don't tell me no she just didn't understand no and she didn't understand the concept of boxing people none of us understood that okay if I was in school and I was academic that doesn't mean I didn't have to represent the, the country in in dancing or mm. basketball or netball or be a lawyer or be a civil engineer or a mechanical engineer um and so like Motsi studied law I did civil engineering my other mm. sister did mechanical engineering but we all represented the country in sports in different things and we all started dance schools and have so my mom was like <laughs> you have to go for it all you you can't just stick to one thing if if you feel like you have the time and you have the love for it do it and we did this as teenagers already so i'm i am so lucky that those are my parents and then they raised us like that like mm. you just have to go out there and as girls especially it's really important that you are ambitious i want to teach you how to mm. be driven and ambitious and and my dad was always like be kind that, that my dad was always like you have to remember to be humble be grateful and be kind and when I was starting out in the UK and people would ask for photos and autographs and mm -hmm. and I would take them and he always would stand on the side he's like no take your time he's like these people are so happy to kind of see you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. always be happy be be humble enough to remember that and i've always 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 kept kind of that mentality with us because our parents taught us that i think that's why you know people love you so much because you you do have a sort of you know the sort of natural warmth and and <laughs> and being you know being open and happy to chat to people because it, it, sometimes people do forget that they get carried away they get lost in the showbiz world and yeah and so, you know that's that's not what it's about. So it's so, so lovely to hear that. Oti, thank you so much for everything today. It's been so brilliant chatting to you and you've got some absolutely great advice for people out there and you're such a brilliant role model in everything that you've sort of achieved and you've done. So it's just really, really inspiring to talk to you. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Oh, she is lovely. Now, our next guest is someone who, like Oti, has never been afraid to not follow a crowd. and. He is confident to take control of his own life. I first met Jake Peach in 2009 when he won a Pride of Britain Child of Courage Award. He was a young child then, and in spite of being treated for leukaemia, he set about raising more than £600,000 for charity to help other sick children. 
like Oti. He's a person with real drive and ambition. And more recently, he's been putting that to fantastic use with the launch of his presenting career. He's won praise for his BBC Essex radio show, which has seen him help discover new talent in the area. Well, Jake and I got together to hear more about the part Pride of Britain played in his past and his dreams for the future. Well, Jake Peach, you look quite uh, quite a bit different since I uh, last saw you back in <laughs> 2009 on the stage when you were just 11. You've grown. Mm, yeah, no, it's uh, although people still say I've got a baby face. So I just want to take you back to 2009, actually before then. You know, for those people who don't know, you suffered a lot with leukemia. Mm. You had treatment at Great Ormond Street and other places. Just just briefly tell us that story of your younger life. So I was a normal, well, so so to speak, normal kid just going about uh, my life in year six of school in, in sunny South Little Sea in Essex and um, sort of at the, at the tail end of the sort of uh, summer after coming back from a holiday in America, um, going back in starting year six, the final year of school, started to get sort of like very strange bruising and started to get quite lethargic and tired and uh, things just weren't right you could tell it was just I was struggling to do usual things that other people other kids were doing around me it wasn't right um, basically me and my mum went to the doctors my mum persisted with them saying you know something isn't right we really need to check this out and was pushing for a blood test and um, thanks to the doctor that recommended me for the blood test because then of course, we got the um, diagnosis. They spotted leukemia in my blood. Um, and then from there on, it was kind of up to Great Ormond Street. Your life completely changes in, you know, a matter of days. And you're on this new course of of life that you don't, that you're not really prepared for at that age, um, at the age of 11. You're kind of old enough to understand what's going on to some degree, but also uh, at the same time, you don't really understand the gravity of what's happening and how serious it is. It was very, very, very serious, wasn't it? I mean, it, it, I, I believe that you were in, in an induced coma for about a month. I was diagnosed with leukaemia. I did have my first course of chemo at Great Ormond Street. Um, they, they, they diagnosed it as the wrong type at first, so they nearly put me on a different treatment that I wasn't gonna, meant to be having. Um, and then they they said, stop everything, let's put you on this one. My first course of chemo didn't go well, um, and I had a really bad reaction to it, and that's what put me in the coma for a month, and I had about 13 different, I've been told this obviously, I didn't know anything about it, um, 13 different needles poking out of me, keeping me asleep, treating me, um, keeping me in a coma, and um, as my mum has said to me, it's very touch and go along all of the times really, and it was literally life or death, um, as close as you could get, to be honest. When you were in your hospital bed, this was where things began to change. You were obviously exceptionally sick and ill. But for some reason or other, and we'll get on to it must be in you somewhere, this will and need to uh, to be a presenter of some description. We're going to come on to your your, your career in a second. But you made a video. Just tell us about that. My mum thought I need something to focus on whilst I'm, you know, getting better. And Great Ormond Street is so great at, you know, doing those kind of things and keeping keeping you preoccupied and, and busy and taking your mind off things. So there was this poster for a video diary that we saw in a lift. Uh, we were going back up to the ward and I said, oh, let's give it a try and, and let's do that. And um, yeah, you could kind of say I was in my element talking people through my, uh, my Hickman line for where my treatments were delivered. And um I was getting so nerdy about like what treatment and what rate it was going in at and everything and, and stuff like that. I think along with loads of other things that people were so great at keeping me busy and, and keep my mind off things. That was certainly one of the the best things to do and, and a sort of a nice working project um, towards the end of that. Yeah. And then you started raising money and this is really where, you know, our pride of Britain winners are, <laughs> quite extraordinary because for normal human beings like myself it would be quite enough uh, if not too much just to be in recovery you know mm. but no not enough for um you probably nine or ten years of age at this point 
uh, not enough for a uh, very young Jake Peach. And you thought, no, you're going to use this and try to raise money for Great Ormond Street. I think people had seen the video diary and I think the charity had caught on to it somehow. Um, and they said, oh, does Jake fancy speaking at a, at a charity event? Um, and that's simply how it came about because the charity obviously came around the wards and, and we're obviously you know, trying to keep our spirits up with, what, with the stuff they were doing. And I'm, I think back to it, my, my first speech I did was at this clay pigeon shoot in Berkshire. And they said, oh, we've got, we've got this event. This is so not kind of like my realm of life. But I didn't, you know, didn't really understand that at the time. And, and it was, it was kind of seemed really exciting. And um, at that point, you'd literally just gone through all of what I'd gone through. The experience was fresh in your mind. And, and you're thinking, you know, they've just saved my life through all of the, the coma and, you know, being in there six months. What better way to say thank you than to just tell my story once and, and hopefully raise some money and, 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 and help the charity and the hostel that had given you so much that you can never repay them for fully. Um, you go down the line and there were loads of amazing things that happened after that. And it's all, almost like a it was a way for obviously for me to tell my story, but a way for me to recover and kind of process what I'd just all gone through, if you see what I mean. And kind of, it was a lovely thing to do, uh, which we only thought it was going to be that one at the time. But it wasn't because it went on and it went on. And when you came to our attention, I think by then <laughs> you'd raised over half a million pounds by then. Something ridiculous like that, yeah. You came to our attention. I can remember being on the, you know, we have a Pride of Britain judging panel, which is the worst mm. job in the world, can I just say? <laughs> of course. Uh, particularly when it comes to judging children of courage. It's, oh, no, can't everybody <laughs> have the award? Um, mm. But, you know, it was this resilience that you have and it, it, it and uh, the che- cheeky Jake, I suppose, who um, kind of appealed uh, to us and the simply the amount of money that you'd raised was was exceptional and um so you came to the pride of britain awards just tell me how you found out that you'd won an award <laughs> so this is slightly embarrassing to remember because i remember breaking down in tears and it probably wasn't the greatest look for me at the time or even to this day um but i was up at the ward and uh, back at great ormond street i hadn't being, I don't think I've been out of hospital fairly long. I mean, it was about a year or something. And I think we were just going back to like say thanks to nursing, catch up with everyone because you form such a close bond. And what when you're in there, and the nurses and the ward becomes your home, it comes your family, and you're so connected to them. Um, so we were back up there this one day, and of course I was sat in this room. I'm brought around, and then you see the cameras out of nowhere and you see Gary Barlow just standing in the middle of the ward that you're being treated at. I mean, it's, it's quite, um, it's really quite cool. crazy when, when you think about that. Yeah. Um, and of course he had the golden envelope and I, I'd, I'd seen actually a bit of a preconception. I'd seen kind of what that was about before, but I wasn't sure I didn't sort of jump to conclusions and then he said it. And, and, um, of course it's overcome the emotion because it's just, winning such an award, uh, you know, like the Pride of Britain, it's, it's a once in a lifetime thing. You, you don't do it for that, obviously, but to have that recognition for what I've been doing and not really, you know, realising that the impact it was possibly having. Can I ask you, are you a Gary Barlow fan? To this day. I mean, my music taste has certainly come a, a bit wider uh, in the time uh, doing the job I do. Um but who doesn't love a bit of take that, right? And then coming to the event, because Pride of Britain, I, I want to explain it to people really, it's, it's a huge event. It, it's monstrously large. The red carpet goes on forever. You know, there are <laughs> banks of photographers and film cameras and glamorous things and people shouting out celebrities' names and all of this. And then you come into the huge room great room at the Grosvenor House or um, we used to be at the Hilton Hotel. Oh, and, and it's just it's just massive. How did you feel as this young child? You were by then, age 11, in mm. 2009. How did you feel about all of that? Overwhelmed, excited, 
um, very taken aback by the the grandeur of everything, and um, you know, uh, it felt it felt like a world away. And in and and again, in that in talk, you know, looking back on the speeches and everything, having this kind of experience, which is a world away from your obviously what you'd gone through in your normal life, it's it's obviously it's lovely. And again, you sort of have to pinch yourself at how lucky and and grateful you've been you you look at other people that have won the awards of that particular year and and you know of course we talk about my story and and of course it had its ups and downs and everything um but some of the other people's stories you're just so humbled to be amongst them and what they've gone through is ever more so you know like amazing and how they've done what they've done. Um, so I I'm think laughing. in a nutshell, there's those feelings. Yeah, Jake, I'm laughing here, not because what you've said is funny, but because every year, every winner says, oh, I understand why X, Y, Z, A, B, C, I've, they're amazing, but I don't understand why I've won one. And it's part <laughs> It's part of almost the definition of a, a Pride of Britain winner is the modesty is is overwhelming. Um, mm. And it is something that, you know, the, the dinner that we have the night before, mm. um, which we call the winner's dinner, uh, which is a very private affair, isn't it? And when I introduce yeah. you all to each other and tell each other's stories, to you know, and it's, and it's to us, that's that's almost our favourite bit. And and it, it always, always, always makes me, you know, people just go, Oh, I like, oh, aren't they amazing? I don't know why I've won an award. <laughs> and then you just said it too. But it's true. It's it's true though. It really is. That that is the feeling you have. And then what about this moment? Because you know, I know standing on the stage, I'm looking out, and basically everybody more or less is like a household name. You kind of recognise everybody, you know, almost know everybody's names. And of course, by the time you get to the event. You know all the other winners as well because we've all had our intimate private dinner the night before. So what was that like coming onto the stage? Because it's only on the stage where you look out and you see absolutely everybody, don't you? Yeah, I mean, obviously incredibly nervous to be in front of all those people, but it's kind of like the the strategy of imagine that no one's in the room or they're all the same person uh, and everything like that. And um don't worry about it too much. But those your strategies then when you went out talking. Absolutely, yeah. Or well, you'd focus on you'd focus on one person in the crowd because if you if you opened up your eyes and saw that everyone you'd you'd just sort of I don't know lose it I think or you just sort of you know crumble under the under the 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 nerves and everything. And then the day after, so what time did you get to bed that night? By the way, <laughs> um. I can't quite remember. I remember James called and asked me if I wanted to come to Peter Streamfellows, which at the time um, I didn't really know what that meant. So, of course, <laughs> very naive Jake just went, yeah, sure. Um, of course, that didn't happen. I think, again, to explain to people who are, are watching, you know, for all of us on the team, it's about celebrating our wonderful, mm. incredible award winners. And then, of course, we all head off, you know, either to the, ballroom or to the bar or to the wherever mm, and mm. everyone's just mixing together aren't they it's like there's almost different parts of pride of you know the whole pride of britain event um and that's where that's where the gossip normally happens but um, <laughs> but then the next day too you know our, our award winners are invited uh to number 10 downing street and mm. you went there didn't you to number 10 where you met yes. Brown as a prime minister at the time. Yeah, he was. And that was, um, again, another remarkable moment in such a short matter of days um, of everything happening. And just what a, what a again, a, what a humbling, amazing experience to be into Downing Street and um, and to go in there. And of course, at the time, I think um, one of Gordon's daughters had, had been treated in Great Ormond Street as well. So there was a kind of weird connection in that sense and actually a common ground to speak about and um you again just randomly talking to the prime minister as you do um it's it's all it's all just very bizarre in in the kind of the best way and um of course to see inside downing street and to to go around and um very few have the privilege of doing it was a, another another monumental experience and um, there was one moment that i 
again, being naive at that age, I didn't quite understand was I, I saw a chair at the cabinet cabinet table in the cabinet office and because it had arms and none of the others did, I thought, Oh, that one looks comfortable. I'm going to sit in that. We were all just sort of waiting for the next bit or anything. And it turns out to be, I, well, I don't know this for sure, but that's the prime minister's chair. And if, if someone else sits in it, that's not the prime minister, it's kind of like bad luck or, you know, it, it's kind of like an unwritten rule that you, you shouldn't do it. And I did it. Um, and, they, and then there was, after about 20 seconds, people realised, and there was, I think there was a couple of gasps or something, and the guy, oh, you can't, can't sit in that, you can't sit in that. And of course, nervous me got up straight away. I was like, oh, sorry. Um, but uh, there was, I think there's a photo of it um, that was in the mirror, I think. Yeah, there is. Smiling, Church, yeah. Chair at one point, and, and now, and then Jake Peach. And I, I think the headlines came... Um, well, peach for prime minister, or, or maybe not quite on those lines, but something like that. You have um, to resurrect those. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, in terms of the fundraising that you continued with that uh, for quite some time, what was your grand total in the end, Jake Peach? So, I mean, I'm along with the the Clay Institute, which I mentioned earlier. Um, the the most the most amazing thing of that time was the. Um, getting charity of the season with Arsenal for Great Ormond Street. And that was, of course, a an incredible amount and um, a great experience again for me, uh, being my basically boyhood club from the age of seven or six. So that was amazing. I think of that and there were, there were pirate shows, acrobatic shows in the Orca as well. I um, put a total on it. I, I, I don't, I, I couldn't tell you. I, I hope you, I hope you know, because I, I don't. Well, we were told that it was well over a million pounds in the end that was wow. raised through all of these events and you going and speaking at these at all of these events, mm. which mm. was like the, the critical part of it. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, extra- it's absolutely extraordinary, Jake. It really is, you know, to have gone through all of that. But I go- I'm going back to what I first said, you know, You started on all of this because you filmed yourself talking about your cancer and your treatment at Great Ormond Street Hospital on camera. Mm. And you kind of liked doing that because it gave you something to do. And you went on and you learned all your strategies of how to speak in public and so on. So could you please tell people, now that you are the grand age of 25? Correct, yep. What is it that you do for a living? I'm a, a radio presenter on, on BBC Local Radio at the moment. <laughs> on BBC Essex? BBC Essex, that's right, yeah. That's amazing. It, it is obviously something in your DNA, Jake. There's something mm. there. So what do you do um, on Radio Essex then? When I first joined, I was kind of, you know, going at the, going at the ground and you make the tea and, um, and you answer the phones and everything and sort of in the in the years called where we are now in sort of the last three years or so um you sort of you ask her if you can do stuff and you get asked to do things as well and um you end up producing the shows that you that you've been on a lower role before and then you i was quite keen to get on the air and stuff so you sort of try and encourage management and bosses to say look here's a demo of what i can do blah 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 um and every Saturday now, I present um, BBC Introducing in Essex, which is like a the BBC's flagship new music uh, platform uh, for all artists across the UK. So I'm sort of the the figurehead in in Essex to kind of be the champion for new music locally, and um, and it's such a great it's like a great thing. Of course, there's loads of work involved that people don't see behind the scenes and all the the effort you, you put in and the preparation. But presenting on radio, it's a dream, um, and to be going all across Essex it's it's everything I could have wished you know sort of all those years back and so now presenting shows still producing things and still doing the things I used to do before but now getting these great opportunities to be on the air and hopefully leads to more I don't know (laughs) Uh, well congratulations young man it's an absolute joy to see you doing something that that comes so naturally to you and uh and giving happiness to yet more people um, mm. You know, it, it, it's just wonderful to see, and that's part of the, you know, the the reason behind this podcast is to, is to catch up on people um, mm. and see. I um, just want to ask you one final question, which is, how's your mum? 
Mum's great. Yeah, she's um, she's in in South End. Um, she's doing fine. She's um, always rollerblading down the seafront or um, at the gym, keeping fit and healthy. And um, yeah, just really really settled down there now and uh, is uh, is doing okay. Yeah, she's doing well. Wonderful. Well, do give her our best. And uh, because when you come to the Pride of Britain, you come as a family and you're part of mm. the Pride of Britain family now. So um, thank you so much for telling us your story and uh, and also about what you're up to now. And um, we should be listening out. <laughs> this is Peachy. Is that what your Instagram name is? Underscore is Peachy, I believe. Add okay. me up. Give me a follow. <laughs> okay, we, we absolutely will. Thank you. Jake Peach, thank you. Thank you. Oh, do you know what? It is always lovely catching up with Jake Peach. I can't wait to see what he'll do next. He's going places, that young man, I'd like to say. A massive thank you to all of our guests this week, our friends at TSB, and of course, and most importantly, probably, you. Without you, we wouldn't have a podcast. Let's catch up next time when we talk to more extraordinary people. Until then, let us know what you think of this and all of our podcasts, and please do subscribe. See you next time.